government is directly intervening, picking winners, if you like, in industry. As we've noted before, already announced a $400 million for green alumina company Alpha HPA, $185 million for graphite miner Renescore, $840 million for rare earths miner Arafura to develop a top-end refinery, a billion dollars to make solar panels in Australia and close to another billion dollars together with Queensland to build a quantum computer here. Well, this week I spoke with Rob Scott, the Chief Executive of West Farmers. Now, for several decades, West Farmers has been considered one of the best and most disciplined investors in Australia, with an acute focus on returns on its shareholders' equity. It owns Bunnings, Kmart, Target Office Works, and the Priceline Pharmacies. It has big investments in lithium processing and chemicals. In each case, the return is the key. Executives in those businesses have to pitch to management for new capital. They only get the capital if they prove they can get exceptional returns. So with that renowned discipline, this week, I sat down and asked Rob Scott why West Farmers has not committed a billion dollars yet to make solar panels in Australia like the federal government just has. <laughs> well, Ross, I think we have more than enough opportunities uh, to invest both in our existing businesses and new businesses. And I guess we have invested over a billion dollars in a lithium mine and processing facility that is going to do two things. It's going to First of all, leverage capabilities we have uniquely in Australia in order to help the world decarbonise. And most importantly, it will help deliver great returns to our shareholders. Did you need the government to give you any of that money to help build that lithium plant? Look, I think the, I think the government plays a really important role in facilitating some of these critical long-term investments. And I must admit, we did get some support from the West Australian government that were able to provide some infrastructure funding to support a new road development. And these are some of the examples where I think governments, both state and federal, can play an important role in facilitating new investments. And you know, many Australian companies, including ourselves, we have strong balance sheets, we have the cash, uh, we are ready to invest if the settings are right. OK, so helping to facilitate is one thing government can do, but that's quite different from government actually picking the winners. Is it right that government should do that? Look, it's a tough one, Ross. I, look, I won't get... I won't be kind of challenging what the government's doing. All I would say is that I can see many opportunities at a very low cost where the governments, both state and federal, can help facilitate investment. There's a lot of capital out there in Australia. There's a lot of capital offshore that wants to invest in Australia. And what I would say is we should try and create the settings to unlock that investment. Uh, that should be the primary focus. So what's on your mind there that they could actually do for you? Well, look, I think there's the, the one thing or well, two things that we find at the moment with a lot of these long lead time projects. Some of the approval processes and the environmental approvals can take a really long time. And time is money for these big projects. So the more that governments can do to not cut corners, we don't want to cut corners, but to to accelerate the process of approval will make a big difference. The other area which is really important is recognising the importance of skilled labour and trades. We are seeing at the moment, for example, our uh, chemicals development in Quinana, we are having to fly welders in from the other side of Australia to do the final stages of our development. Uh, we have a shortage of skilled trades, and what is making that even more challenging is not just our lithium project, but a lot of trades are not available to actually deliver another problem, which is residential construction. So we're seeing residential construction costs continued to escalate and we know we need another 1.2 million homes in Australia. So I think that these are areas where access to skilled labour, accelerating time frames and potentially providing some support around infrastructure investment, all of those things will certainly encourage us to invest even more. So does it trouble you that if government gives money or loans directly to one individual project that other projects, worthy projects, might actually miss out on the funding? Well, I think at the moment, given that we have a very tight labour market, uh, the reality is that when, you know, we're all competing for the same talent, we're all competing for the same workers and not just at a, at say a mining level or an infrastructure level, but also the point I mentioned that we ask, it might ask ourselves, why have construction costs for new home builds and renovations gone up 40 or 50 per cent? There is real competition around skilled labour there. So look, there is a concern of how we are 
using the capital and the talent that we need to take advantage of these opportunities. But look, I, I do want to say, Ross, that there have been examples where our businesses have benefited from targeted investment of the WA state government and even the federal government with their Powering the Regions Fund helping us to invest in new technology to decarbonise our chemical plants. So there are some positive examples out there. But you're investing in some of those green areas of the emerging energy needs, you know, say for example, lithium plant you've spoken about, but also into potentially ammonia in the future. Is this a way in which private enterprise and government should be sitting side by side to ensure that those projects do get up? That's correct. And look, I think there are a few areas where I think the policy settings could evolve to really encourage Australian companies and foreign companies to invest more in Australia. And examples would be the important role that carbon capture and storage will have as a transitionary way of decarbonising. We're developing a project in Western Australia that could help us have the confidence to invest in a new ammonia plant rather than just importing ammonia from offshore. The other area I think is potentially thinking about how we could use investment allowances to help encourage Australian businesses to invest in areas of decarbonisation uh, to really encourage, um, encourage that investment. These are some things that are worth looking at. Okay, so can I ask you about a totally different thing and that is the so-called cost of living crisis. I mean, given the fact that you have got Bunnings and Target and Kmart and Officeworks, you know, you can see whether this is real or is it something that simply is being manufactured by Canberra to take attention off our politicians? Look, I, I think it's hard to blame the government for the cost of living crisis. Uh, there are many factors. There have been many factors post-COVID at a global level that have led to inflationary pressures. There's no doubt that we are seeing some domestic inflation pressures be quite enduring. Well, you've seen it with your wage claims that have come through. We have. And look, there are things where we do need to reflect on the policy settings in Australia to consider what's happening with energy costs, what's happening with wage costs and so forth. Yes, but government would say that you made lots of profits, that you should and can afford higher wages. Well, look, I think we are very happy to pay higher wages. And in many respects, higher wages is a great thing for our businesses because people that are earning more ultimately spend more money uh, in our stores and we like paying our teams more but it's got to come with productivity. At the end of the day uh, we are very happy to pay more if we're trying to create more value. Do you think government actually understands that connection that unions understand the connection? Well look I think it's a challenging one. I think there's a misunderstanding of really the drivers and the benefit of productivity uh, but it is something we all have to face into. Uh, and look, I would like to think that there are ways in which we can keep improving the prosperity of Australians. What does concern me is the fact that on a, GD, on a GDP per capita basis, we do seem to be going backwards. There is a lot more we can do to unlock the potential of Australian businesses, of Australian workers, and both share in the benefits. West Farmers now is becoming a very large organisation with not only your own strategic areas of investment but also just the number of sheer companies it's got. In the future, do you see there would be benefit in actually spinning out some of these businesses to become their own separate businesses? Well, at the moment, Ross, I'm really pleased with the shape of the portfolio. We've got some very strong large businesses, Bunnings, Kmart, our WestF division, uh, that have a lot of growth opportunities. And then we have other smaller businesses with a lot of longer term potential like health and lithium and also office work. So I'm quite excited about how the, how the portfolio is positioned. And the great thing about our decentralised model is that it's very scalable. In the current environment, we're seeing so many remarkable changes to different businesses, different industries. There's a lot of disruption going on. And so a point I made today at our strategy day is that I think that the West Farmers model of capital allocation, being able to adjust the portfolio over time makes us very adaptable and very resilient in today's world. Rob Scott, always good to chat to you. Many thanks for your time.